quindi adesso dov'è dov il mio collega austriaco Harald Kittler e secondo me lui fa uno dei più belle relazioni sul neodisplastico e spero che chiarisce adesso un po' il concetto perché per me personalmente l'ha fatto. Ok, grazie Harald. Thank you. I, I understood that. But you, no, you, you cannot hear me. Speak up. Speak up. Hello, hello. It's better. Can you, can you turn it louder? Because One, two, three. Better? Yes. So I understood that what Iris said, but I cannot clarify the concept of the dysplastic nevus because there is confusion since 30 years. How can I clarify it in 30 minutes? But I will try. I would ask you to forget everything what you've learned about the dysplastic nevus. Otherwise, you would say, what is he telling us? And I would ask you to start, let's say, rethink some things about the dysplastic nevus. And I will ask some questions and try to answer them with you. And I hope I will destroy some myths that you know about the dysplastic nevus. So do patients with multiple nevi all have the dysplastic nevus syndrome? No. In your judgment, does this patient have the dysplastic nevus syndrome, yes or no? No. Who would say yes? So. Yes, yes. Who would say this patient has the dysplastic nevus syndrome? Yeah. Well, there is a lot of confusion. Now, let's. This patient obviously has multiple large nevi, yeah? so larger than one centimeter. And you know that originally the dysplastic nevus was defined as a nevus larger than one centimeter with asymmetric pigmentation and so on and so on by Clark. Now, let's have a look at some of the lesions. Let's have a look at this lesion here, a close-up. You can see terminal hairs. What type of nevus is this? A congenital nevus, right. How do you know? Because there is an increase of terminal hairs. Are you sure? Yes, you can be sure. It's a congenital nevus. It's a small congenital nevus. Now let's look at the lesion with the dermatoscope. Huh? What is the pattern? Globular, yeah, fine. So this nevus is obviously congenital nevus with a, con with a globular pattern. Most nevi have a, uh, congenital nevi have a globular pattern. Now let's look at another lesion of the same patient. Let's look here at this lesion. What type of nevus is it? Congenital. Are you sure? It may not be present at birth, yeah? but it is congenital. What is the dermatoscopic pattern? Globular. globular. So it's again the same lesion, the same pattern, congenital. Now let's look at this lesion here of the same patient. This lesion does not have an increase of terminal hairs. So you don't know, is it congenital? Is it dysplastic or is it acquired? Dermatoscopically, it has the same pattern than the other lesions. What do you think, what type of lesion is it? Congenital, of course, the same pattern dermatoscopically, the same diagnosis. Yeah? So many of the so-called dysplastic nevi are in reality small congenital nevi. No? Not all patients with the dysplastic nevus syndrome have large or middle, uh, have uh, congenital nevi. Some are required, of course, and they have a mix of different types of nevi. There is no question that these patients have an increased risk to develop melanoma. But the original idea was that the dysplastic nevus is not only a risk marker, it's also a precursor. And this, uh, this was, there was a lot of confusion about this. Now, what do we mean when we clinicians call a nevus dysplastic? Maybe this is a good start. What do we really mean? And let's, you know this patient, I showed this in the first talk. Let's look at her lesions again. How many lesions are dysplastic or atypical? It's the same yeah, for me. Let's look at the lesions. Are there moderately dysplastic lesions or moderately atypical? And how many are severely atypical or so on? What, is this lesion dysplastic? Yes? Yes, no, yes. Is this lesion dysplastic? No. Is this lesion dysplastic, this one? Well, is this lesion? So 
this lesion maybe, or this lesion, or this lesion, is this dysplastic? Well, when, when we say the lesion is dysplastic or atypical, and some of you might say this is the most atypical one, we try to express our diagnostic uncertainty. This is what we do when we say a lesion is atypical. It means that we are not sure whether it's an early melanoma or it's a nevus. Diagnostic uncertainty. That's what, how we use the word atypical nevus. No? But we act as if our diagnostic uncertainty is also biologic uncertainty, as if the nevus doesn't know if it wants to become a melanoma or not. In reality, it's only in our heads. So we, when we call it atypical, think that dysplasia or atypia is some kind of missing link between a benign nevus and a melanoma. But is this true? Is there a proof for that? Or is this just an assumption? We call this the gray zone. And what I'm going to do in my talk is I want to show you where the real gray zone is. This is the real gray zone. Yeah? There is no other gray zone. Yeah? The uncertainty is not in the nevus, it's in our head. Where does this myth of a precursor or a missing link come from? It's an old story. It has always been here on the planet. It's easy. What is your diagnosis? This is a photograph of a textbook of dermatology from the 1920s. What's your diagnosis? Junctional nevus. <laughs> is there any doubt that this, lesion, that this lady has a melanoma? No. So now let's look at the, at the legend. Pigmented senile patch developed its present size in the course of a few years. Non-malignant. Non they thought it is non-malignant because it was a patch. They thought then only nodules are malignant. And this is the pre-malignant stage. Another example here from a textbook of the 1960s. Is this a melanoma? Is this a melanoma? This is the same lesion, and is this a melanoma? Obviously, this is the development of the melanoma. What do they tell us? A, senile lentigo, two months duration. B, pre-malignant stage, pre-malignant, 18 years duration. C, with area of malignant degeneration. This was always there, the precursor stage. Yeah? Now we laugh at it. It seems laughable to us. But obviously, this was a misconception from the beginning. And they called it, they gave them different names. But this is where the misconception started, and it still continues. What do dermatolo dermatopathologists mean when they say dysplastic or atypical? Well. This is from a textbook of dermatopathology in the 1970s. And it's, a, it's one that is very famous. And what did it tell us? This junctional severe dysplasia shows blah, blah, blah. Is a dermatopathologist here? Well, I'm a dermatopathologist, and I can tell you there is no doubt that this lesion is a melanoma in situ. Yeah? Uh, you see uh, atypical melanocytes all over the place. Yeah? So what they called at the beginning severe dysplasia in reality was melanoma in situ. Yeah? There's another example of the, same, of the same guy, the same textbook. So also the dermatopathologist had a gray zone, but they had the gray zone also in their head, and the dermatopathologists used severe dysplasia sometimes also today to express what? Their diagnostic uncertainty, but not to express biologic uncertainty which is something different. The real gray zone, again, also in the head of the dermatopathologists. The, the reason for gray zones in morphology are there are no criteria, bad criteria, or criteria that do not work or do not, are not applied. I will not go into the details. What, if an atypical nevus exists, what is a common nevus? What is a typical nevus? Well, this is from textbook of Polonia. This is the typical, typical nevus. Yeah? And what do they show us when they show us a typical or common nevus? A congenital nevus, yeah? usually a small congenital nevus. Why do they call it typical? Because there is no danger to, that this is a melanoma, because it looks typical. But it is a nevus. And the contrast to atypical only means I'm sure that this is a nevus and not a melanoma. Yeah? 